most of our existence as human beings, we've been hunter-gatherers. Uh, when we started agriculture maybe 10,000 years ago and it spread around the rest of the world, we, had a, we were an, uh, adopting a very new experiment. And although numbers of people went up, the interesting thing is quite often they find that the hunter-gatherer skeletons from that kind of swap over period, they were bigger, healthier, uh, and they appeared to live longer than their farming brothers. I think the reason why the hunter-gatherers died out is because the farmers could have more children more frequently and they just outbred the hunter-gatherers. What we've got on our table here is just a few of the items they would have used in their everyday lives, hunting and gathering. Stone or flint, wood, dried fungi, antler, stinging nettle fibre. Flint's a wonderful thing. You can knock bits off it very easily and end up with a razor sharp edge. It will cut through animal hide and leather and everything else very, very efficiently. You can hold it like this and then you can skin and uh, gut and joint an animal with this. You can work wood with this. You can work hide with this. Keep re-napping the edge to resharpen it. Take that tool, mount it in a piece of wood. They would have had the kind of classic that we all know and this is, I think, is rather attractive. It's the flint-headed axe carved out of a, a piece of branch, let in, a glue made out of pine resin mixed with soot, and then the binding to finish holding it in is made out of either stinging nettle fibre or animal sinew. So that's a basic tool that would actually, they used of cutting down the wood from the forest, and then for shaping, making vessels or even dug out canoes, this is the other alternative. And basically, if you look, it's very simple. What you've got, is actually the main trunk here of the tree with a branch coming off. And you can, that gives you that shape, which gives you a very good adst for actually cutting into and shaping into a piece of wood. So that's just two examples. If you get pine resin from a pine tree where it's been leaking out, it goes soft and liquid in heat. And then if you add a bit of ground up soot into it, it acts almost like natural fiberglass. The resin is the glue, the fibers in the soot act as the binding. And then what we do to make it stop it being too brittle is add a little bit of beeswax. And you can use it as a very effective glue. And then what I do when I'm finished with it, if I've got any left over, is as it cools down, I just do this in the hands. And then we keep it as little round balls for repair work as we need it. We combine the red deer antler with little small bits of flint. They're the little bits that came off in the napping process, razor sharp, and we've put this into a very simple, very effective scythe. So that if you're collecting plants like tall grasses, all you have to do is grab the top and turn around like that and cut through. Very, very efficient. We have to be really careful because these edges are so sharp, they're actually sharper than steel edges. So that's the sort of combination they would have used. I've actually cut myself far more napping these flint blades than I have actually working metal blades. And here, this stinging nettle fibre turned into string. And this is a trapping net for small animals. So they would have been laying things like this over animal dens or holes and trapping the animals because it's far less work if you lay out a load of traps than it is from actually having to go out and hunt an animal. And small animals aren't as dangerous as big animals. Use it to carry stuff round. So stinging nettle fibre is a very vital material. And the other thing they would have used lots of is animal sinew. This is deer leg sinew. You can't eat it, it's far too hard. If you hammer it out, you get lots of little strands of the sinew fibres, individual strands of it, plait them, and you end up with an incredibly strong fibre. It's the strongest one we've got. They would have made their own clothing. Very small needles that are made out of bone or deer antler. You can put your sinew fibre through and you've got your classic needle and thread. I think stitching is one of our most important inventions because with that, when we moved out of Africa and we moved into cold climates, we could make clothing that actually fitted the body, which meant that you could keep warm in a much colder environment. People started coming back into our country at the end of the Ice Age. As the weather warmed up and the climate changed, forests would have set in and people would have then come in and settled into our country permanently. They would have eaten the big animals, reindeer, red deer, a roe deer, uh, fallow slightly later on, horses, 
Uh, European bison was another animal that we hunted. Wild boar that came in later with the forest. So they were eating a kind of whole range, but including quite often all the different types of uh, duck and uh, geese, maybe likely, fish. There's a even possibility they ate insects because insects are very nutritious as well. Nuts and all the different roots and other plants. They would have been harvesting everything. We know from North American Indians that if they came across a new thing and they wanted to see it was a food, they'd get the young men to test it because they were the fittest and the most resilient. Um, and they also the ones that you could afford to lose one or two of them without affecting the tribe. Um, quite often the first thing they'd do was smell it and if it smelled strange they wouldn't touch it. Then they would actually put a little bit of it on their tongue and their lips and if it burnt they knew that they don't go any further. Then they would put a tiny bit and just keep it in their mouth and see what the effect was. And then from that, they'd actually try swallowing a little bit and then they'd build up. And it's only when the young Indian men have actually checked that the food was safe that everyone else would have very likely tried it. There would be clearings with fresh grass growing through near up to lakes and streams, which again encourages the deer to come in and graze and drink from the stream, which means you don't have to go too far to hunt the animal you're going to hunt. And then as new ideas came in from the Middle East and the continent, people quite quickly swapped over to producing what we, we would call crops and living in almost semi-permanent villages. Something else that we've produced from the wood is this, which is a digging stick. We got this idea from the Aborigines in Australia. They use these a lot for digging up plants. Straight piece of wood, you can use it as a walking stick. Uh, we've got a bit of um, a deer antler with barbs, which you can use for trapping animals or for catching fish. What we've done is far hardened it. So for digging into the ground, it's a really effective piece of kit. Another thing, great thing about this is if you get break off, you can reshape it with your piece of flint, far harden it again and, already, and away you go. They didn't kind of need to rely on someone else's manu manufacturing skills. They could actually produce everything they needed themselves. For hunting, spears. The whole thing we have learned from hunter-gatherers is they had a huge respect for the animal and its spirit. And quite often uh, hunter, modern hunter-gatherers will say a prayer to the animal spirit, thanking the animal for giving up its flesh so they can live. Reindeer antler is incredibly strong, very resilient. You can get it really, really sharp. We've got the glue and then the sinew binding holding it on the top. Very simple tool made out of it in a woodland setting. Stone-headed spear, much heavier one to keep the animal back and a big heavy piece of wood so it can't break in the process. It's not a throwing spear, this one, but I have got a throwing spear. It's much, much lighter, flint blade on the top, and then these two bits of flint down here act as the barbs, and they are really, really sharp. Very, very effective way of doing it. What I always say is don't forget that these were the same people as us. We're still basically Stone Age people running around in a modern society. Being pregnant and giving birth and bringing up small children must have been a very, very tough job in those days. And the shape of this figure there with the large breasts and a lot of body fat, I think actually shows the importance of that. Nowadays, we, we look upon fat in a very different way. For them, especially for our breastfeeding mother, is that if the mother was thin and she was breastfeeding and hasn't got any spare body fat, if they hit a period when they run out of food, then quite quickly the mother's milk would stop and the baby would die. But if the mother's got a lot of body fat, then she's carrying around reserves of food for her, hit a time of hardship and she could carry on feeding the baby and the baby would survive. So that means that tribe has got a higher chance of surviving than a small tribal group where the mums don't put on natural body fat. We've become so dissociated with natural living that we've uh, forgotten how important it is to um, conserve and to look after the natural environment. It's not something you can just leave. It's not a wilderness. It's something that has to be looked after, conserved. If you just take everything um, out of, or one species, out of your woodland environment, there's nothing there for it to, to regrow back. Take a little, encourage what's left, and then you've got a regular harvest that you can use year upon year.